Hello friends, welcome to this channel. So in this series, we are going to cover Spring Boot and we are actually going to learn Spring Boots and the basics of web development with it by building a simple web application. And this is going to be a hands-on session wherein we will cover the nitty gritties of Spring Boot and how a framework like this works. So are you excited? Let's get started. So let's get started with the absolute basics. So we'll start discussing by what is a web framework. Now first let's understand why do you need a web framework and what gaps does something like this fill in. So if you look at all the modern web applications or most of them, they all have a lot of things common in them. For example, all the web applications need a way to serve web page to a user when the user tries to access certain URL, right? All the web applications need to communicate to the database. Like they need to save information to the tables and they need to save and fetch as well. They also need to manage the security. Like this is also common. Okay. So security databases, URLs, authentication, all of this are common functionalities across major web applications. Now, a question that you should ask yourself is, should you build all this functionality from scratch every time? Okay, so you as a developer would be working on multiple web applications, you will be building and deploying a lot of stuff. So all of this is common. And it's a common piece of code that you have to replicate all the time. You can think of this as a need for a boilerplate in your life. Okay. So it's not necessarily important that you should do this every time from scratch. Okay. Now you can compare this with the analogy of building a house. Okay. So to build a house, you would need a blueprint and a set of tools. Now web development also works in a similar way where you need some sort of a blueprint wherein you have a set of things predefined. Okay. Now earlier, in early days of web development, developers had to build all of this right from scratch. So they had to write raw code, like for HTTP requests, database interactions, template rendering, and so on. Okay. But this process was pretty much time consuming and it led to a lot of error. Like it was pretty much error prone. Okay. So there has to be a better way. Now imagine when you're building a house. Okay. What if you have some prefabricated components like pre-built walls, you have pre-built windows and pre-built doors as well. So you, you have doors of different sizes walls of different sizes and windows also of different sizes. And depending on the size of the house you're building, you can pick the wall, door and windows, okay, based on your requirement. Now, so that would, of course, lead to faster assembling, okay, it would lead to fewer errors. And also it would be much more precise, right? Because you already have a template that you have set because these are just the repetitive tasks that you need whenever you build a new house. Okay. So you could think of this as a prefabricated component. So this analogy of prefabricated components, uh, which helps you assemble faster and it even helps you reduce a lot of errors. Okay. Now this is where things go fast and this is where web framework comes into picture. Now you can think of this house building analogy where you had a lot of prefabricated components, which led to faster build time. Okay. You can compare this with web development and that is where a web framework comes into picture. So a web framework has a lot of prefabricated components like in the analogy of house. Okay. So it has a lot of prefabricated components that enable you to build your web application quickly. Okay. Now, when you build a web application, you know that you need a way to, let's say access a URL, you need a way to serve users request, you need to authenticate and all of this. So that is where you can have a set of boilerplate. Okay. Which is nothing but a web framework. So what a web framework is, it is nothing but a collection of pre-built tools and modules 
that you will need to do standard tasks across all the applications, okay? Now you can think of this like an authentication, database accessing, and so on, all right? So all of this is combined and packaged as a web framework because you as a developer will need all of this depending on the kind of website you are building. And whatever you need, you can make use of that. For example, if you are not making use of authentication in one of your projects, that's perfectly fine. You don't need to use authentication then, right? So this way you can use whatever you want from the pre-built set of components and go forward. So like in our house building analogy, you were free to pick whatever you want. Like if you want walls, you can pick walls. If you are building a house without uh, windows, so you can skip that, okay? It's up to you. So this, this is something similar that is applicable in web frameworks as well. So some of the popular web frameworks that exist in the world are Spring Boot, okay? So this is a Java based web framework and it is known for its ability to build enterprise grade applications really quickly. So some major enterprises use Spring Boot and if you are working in Java, it's really important that you learn about Spring Boot soon. So Spring Boot, then we have Django, which is a Python based web framework, and it is known for its batteries included philosophy. So if you read a bit about Django on the web, you will see this term batteries included everywhere, which means that it includes a lot of common functionalities built in, all right? Then you have Flask, which is also a Python based framework. It is lightweight, more flexible and it is super great for small projects or whenever you need more control on your project. So that is where Flask comes in. It is pretty much lightweight when it comes to comparison with Django. Then you have Express. So this is a JavaScript based web framework and it is a part of a mean or mern stack. So by mean, I, so mean stands for MongoDB, Express.js, Angular, and Node.js. And MERN, which is M-E-R-N, stands for Mongo, Express, React, and Node.js, okay? So this, these are tech stacks that you can use, and Express is widely used for building APIs with JavaScript, okay? Then you have Ruby on Rails, which is a Ruby-based framework. So Ruby is a programming language, and you have ROR, so, Ruby on Rails is also popularly known as ROR. And uh, it is a Ruby based framework, which is also quite popular. So these are some of the popular web frameworks that exist in the world today. And depending on the programming language that you are learning, you can pick any of these frameworks and start building your applications. They enable you to build and deploy your applications faster than the traditional approach wherein you had to write everything from scratch, okay? So a lot of things are pre-built in this framework, like ability to interact with the database, like ability to interact with the server host and so on, all right? So basically what I mean over here is it accelerates your development time. And if you're building a web application today, you should use a web framework. So this is about web framework. Let us now start talking about Spring Framework. So what is Spring Framework? So Spring Framework takes away the hassle, okay? And it's a comprehensive open source framework for Java. So Spring Framework has a lot of features built in, which makes it quite popular in the Java world. Okay, let us talk about some of the amazing features that Spring Framework has to offer us. So the number one feature would be inversion of control. Now, what does inversion of control mean? Okay, so inversion of control means Spring manages the lifecycle and the configuration of application objects, okay? Now, what I mean by application objects. So these are the objects that are created during the lifetime of your application, okay? So when you run your application, there will be some objects that will be created and you will need to use them. So Spring manages the life cycle and even the configuration of these objects. It reduces the dependencies and it increases the flexibility for developers, okay? 
And whenever you need these objects, Spring makes it available for you. Okay, so you don't have to take the hassle of uh, managing these objects. Now, because of this feature, you can build applications that are not tightly coupled. So let me explain by what I mean over here. Okay, so let us take an example of uh, the source code that I have over here. So in this source code, I have message service. This is an interface. It has a method defined or declared, I should say. It has a method declared, which is string get message. And this is being used by this particular class, email service, okay? And it defines this particular method over here, all right? Now let us say we have another class called SMS client, which uses this particular message service and it's dependent on this particular class over here, like, or message service is an interface. So it is using the message service interface to make use of email service class, okay? So it's creating the instance of email service class and it's assigning to the message service, all right? Now, this is a dependency and whenever you create an object of SMS client, okay, this object is automatically created and it's assigned to the message service instance, which is an interface. All right. Now, if you take a look at this code, this code is tightly coupled. So SMS client is tightly coupled with this dependency class. Okay. Now SMS client explicitly knows about and creates this instance over here. And that is why we are calling it as tightly coupled. Okay. Now this is not good. Okay. Like, okay, this code would run, you can make use of this, but this does not promote loose coupling. Okay. So with inversion of control feature, you can make use of dependency injection. And with the help of dependency injection, the dependencies are defined by you and they are injected at runtime by spring. Okay. So what I mean by that, let me explain this to you. So when you write the same source code with spring framework, how would you write it? So take a look at this source code now, okay? Now, what is happening over here is we are not creating an instance and we are not initializing the message service class over here. So like in our previous example, if you take a look over here, okay? We were creating an instance of email service and assigning it to message service, which is an object of message service interface, okay? But here, suddenly, we are not doing that what we are doing is instead, we are accepting a parameter in a constructor and we are assigning that parameter to the object over here, okay? Now, this is more flexible and more modular as the class itself does not need to be concerned with creating or managing the dependencies, okay? Now, the question is, how is, or who, who is passing this object over here? Or how is this initialized? Okay, so who gives message service object over here and how is this initialized? So the answer is Spring Framework, okay? So when I said dependency injection, so what happens is when you run this particular piece of code using Spring Framework, what Spring Framework will do is it will provide the instance of message service through the constructor during the runtime. Okay. And this is what the inversion of control feature is. So with inversion of control, the Spring's IOC container. So there is an IOC container that Spring Framework has. It manages the life cycle of objects. Okay. And it injects the appropriate implementation of message service over here. Okay. So message service is an interface over here. All right. So it injects the appropriate implementation of message service to this particular constructor during the runtime. And because Spring is providing the instance during the runtime, it allows for loose coupling between components and it promotes a modular design, which makes testing and maintenance easier. Okay. And it also enables the separation of concerns. So here, like we, we have not written the code, which is tightly coupled. Okay. So tomorrow, like if I have to go back and if I see this code over here, so I have 
given the i've created the object of message service and during run time appropriate implementation of message service is provided to the constructor that we defined using spring okay now if the implementation changes in future spring will make sure that the appropriate implementation available at that time is provided to the instance of message service right so even if the implementation changes you don't have to change your source code over here okay and that is what loose coupling is so loose coupling means whenever you are changing something the other parts of code are not impacted whereas in this piece of code like the one without using the inversion of control feature here this is tightly coupled okay so if the implementation changes so for example if we change this to something else so this is now instead of email service this is let's say some other service like mail service or let's say sms service or something like that so if this changes then this changes as well now this is changing because it's tightly coupled okay and here we have moved to a inversion of control feature okay we are making use of inversion of control feature and because of that it's not tightly coupled okay and because of this loosely coupled and because of this feature of dependency injection we have a modular code so this is inversion of control done with the help of this constructor and we get the dependency on runtime so this is about inversion of control now we have data access so spring framework also provides a simplified and consistent way to handle data access from various sources like jdbc hibernate gpa and so on okay then spring is an mvc framework and it provides a clean separation between the presentation code okay so what i mean by presentation layer is the code which manages the interface okay so whenever you access the application from the browser the source code or whatever is being managed in the browser whatever the user sees is the presentation layer okay and then you have the logic part and then the database access part which is separated so mvc makes sure that model view and controller are separated so this you will see once you start building the applications with spring boot then you have transaction management okay so spring provides a unified way to manage transactions across objects okay and spring also has a security feature which is highly customizable feature rich okay and whenever you are building like enterprise grade web applications security becomes crucial and spring framework provides us with authentication authorization and protection against some of the common security vulnerabilities all right so that's spring framework so there are a couple of more features which is testing support so so spring framework helps or it has a really good support for unit testing frameworks and integration testing okay it provides uh good integration with uh, j unit mokito and so on okay also spring framework provides support for internalization and localization and this allows developers to build application that can be easily adapted for different languages and locals if you have to talk about some history about spring framework so this framework came into existence in 2002 and this was developed by rod johnson okay now prior to this everyone was building applications in a traditional way in java so johnson's goal was to create a lightweight alternative to java ee platform okay so java ee was being used at that time which was not a simplified way to web development then johnson thought of uh, creating an alternative which is lightweight and that is how the first version of spring was released in march 2004 okay and it had lots of core feature and since then it has gone major developments and versions have been released all right so so that's about spring framework let us talk about spring boot so what is spring boot So Spring Boot is open source java based framework used to create standalone production grade 
applications that are based on Spring and Java. Now, how does Spring Boot differs from Spring and what is the difference between them? So when it came to building applications with Spring frameworks, there were a lot of steps involved in setting up configuration, writing boilerplate code and deployment of the app. Yes, Spring Framework reduced a lot of boilerplate code which developers had to do initially, but still there were some gaps. Like developers still had to do configuration, setup, and a lot of things before they could run their application. And this was the gap that was filled by Spring Boot. So what Spring Boot did is it offered a set of pre-configured components or defaults that are typically needed for application to run or application to work. And it eliminated the need for a lot of boilerplate code that was involved in setting up a Spring application. So Spring Boot is based on Spring and it makes a lot of things even more easier when you compare it with Spring. You can think of Spring Boot as Maggie. So if you are making a Maggie, you will just open the sachet, okay, put in all the ingredients that come in within that particular sachet and you are done, okay? So basically that Maggi packet has everything you need to make a tasty noodle, okay? A basic noodle within like two to five minutes. So that is what Spring Boot is. Essentially, it, it is a package which has, which has everything that you need to start building and deploying your web application, okay? So you can think of Spring Boot as it's a combination of Spring Framework, pre-built configuration and embedded servers. Yes. So when running application, you also need to deploy the application to a server, right? How will you run a server side web application? You need a server. And if you are doing development locally, of course, you will need to set up some local server on your system. So Spring Boot makes all of this easier. And when you create a Spring Boot project, you have all of this pre-configured. So you just have to hit the run button and you just see your application running and being deployed onto your server. You don't need an external server or you don't need to do a separate server setup. So initially, like before Spring Boot, you had to set up a local server, okay, deploy the application on that and then check changes. Okay, so this in, this had some hassle. Of course, Spring Framework reduced the hassle that developers had to do before Spring came into picture. But with Spring Boot, it became even more easier. Now, we will also take a look at pre-built configuration. So wh what I mean by pre-built configuration is, like you don't have to focus on configuration, configuring things. So when you add a database or when you want to use a database into your application, you will have to do a set of configuration. Like you will, uh, earlier developers need to add dependencies and do a lot of stuff. So there was a series of steps that developers had to do to make the application work. But with this pre-built configuration feature, you just have to specify few properties, like what is the username, what is the host URL of database and password and some some additional properties depending on the kind of database that you are using, but that is it and it's all done. So the configuration will be automatically done by Spring Boot. So this is what Spring Boot is. Now let us talk a bit about the components of Spring Boot. So the number one component is Spring Boot starters. So what are Spring Boot starters? Now these are a set of dependency descriptors or dependencies that exist, which make your life much more convenient. Okay. So for example, you can think of this as ready to use ingredient packs. Okay. So if you're building a web application, you have a starter project for web. So what does it contains and how it makes your life easier? So a web starter will have everything that a typical web application needs. For example, like you might need a way to handle REST API request. So these different things that are needed by a typical application are handled by these starter projects. There is also a starter for working with database. So it's called a starter JPA project. Okay. Now what it brings in is it brings in 
the JPA configuration, then JDBC configuration together. So you just have to include that startup project and you are ready to work with database. That is it. So this is Spring Boot starters. Then you have Spring Boot auto configuration. This is something we just discussed. So it automatically configures your Spring Boot application based on the jar dependency that you have added. So for example, if you have added a dependency to work with database, Spring Boot knows that it needs to configure database then. So this is auto configuration. Then you have Spring Boot actuator. So this is one of the non-functional requirements that every web application has. So whenever you are building a web application, you would need a way to monitor its health, like do some metric gathering. You might need to do some HTTP tracing and so on. And this is not mentioned as a requirement by any of the clients. So you as a developer have to make sure that your application is healthy up and running. Now, how would you monitor your application? So that is what Spring Boot Actuator is. It enables you to monitor your application. So this is a ready to use feature, okay? And you can tweak it uh, as needed by you. But this is one of the amazing features of Spring Boot. Then you have embedded server. So when you want to run your application, okay? You don't need to configure a separate server. So you have a standalone embedded server which will run your application as a jar file, okay? And this eliminates the need of you managing the headache of deploying your application on a separate server, okay? Then you have Spring Boot Dev Tools, and it is it consists of some development time tools that uh, enhance the productivity during application development, and it provides features like uh, automatic application restart, live reload of some static resources if you have added. So static resources like CSS, HTML, JavaScript, and so on. So these are the components. Now, if you have to talk about advantages, number one advantage is it's standalone. So you can quickly get started with Spring Boot, okay? You don't need to deploy your application to the server and you are just ready. So you just configure the project, you create a Spring Boot project, you import it or open it with your favorite ID and you are ready to write code, okay? It's standalone and standalone meaning it does not need to be deployed separately on a server. It comes in with an embedded server so it can work on its own. Then it has starter code. So I explained what starter projects are and it makes your life much more easier, okay? Then you have to do less configuration, of course, because of the auto configuration feature. It reduces the cost and the application development time as well. Now, why do developers love Spring Boot? Number one, it's Java based. It's fast and easy to use. It comes with an embedded server and it has various plugins available and a lot of community support as well. It and eliminates the need for writing boilerplate code and configurations. Now, when it comes to building application with Spring Boot, there are different tiers that we should be aware of. So the number one is the presentation layer, and then you have the service layer, then data access layer. So these different tiers, or you can even call them layers, are categorized into these three parts. Okay, and this is a part of Spring Boot architecture. So let's understand what they are. So what is a presentation layer? So presentation layer presents the data and the application features to the user. Okay, and this is a layer wherein all the controller classes exist. Now, what is a controller? So whenever you send a request to your web application, controller does the job of handling that request, okay? And it's a part of presentation layer. And this layer is responsible for accepting the request from the user, validating the inputs the user has given and passing it to the next layer, which is the service layer. Now, what is a service layer? So service layer is a layer where business logic of the application resides. And all the tasks such as evaluations, decision-making, processing of data is done at this particular layer. 
Now this layer will be frequently called by the presentation layer and once the processing of request is done, service layer will take help of data access layer to fulfill the user's request. Now what is a data access layer? So as the name suggests, this layer is where all the repository classes reside. Now repository classes are the classes that talk to the database. Okay. So all these classes will reside over here and they will talk to the underlying databases. So for example, if I have a browser and if the user is accessing our application from the browser, so how will it access? So we have our application hosted on our server. Now this request will be intercepted by controller. Controller will pass on this request to the service. Service will pass on to the repository or the data access layer, which will in turn talk to the database and get the desired results and pass it on to the user. So this is how the request flows in a typical Spring Boot application. Now, what are we going to build with Spring Boot? So with Spring Boot, we are going to build an application that will help us store and retrieve challenges that are stored monthly. So these are the endpoints that we'll define in our application. So we will have a get request to slash challenges, and this will enable us to get the list of all the challenges. Then if we want to get a challenge for a specific month, you can use this endpoint. You can say get challenges and pass in the month. So you can say one. So one will give you the challenge for January. Then you can also create challenge using this post request. You can update any challenge. So you can use a put request to update this challenge and you can pass in the ID. And then you also have the delete request. So you can delete any of the challenges you wish to. So this is a simple application that we are going to build. And in the process, we are going to learn the nitty gritties of Spring Boot while building, all right? And this is how our application is going to look like. So it's going to function this way, wherein a user can send a request from the browser. Then from the browser, the request is handled by the controller. So we are going to have a challenge controller over here. And this challenge controller will validate the request. And from here, it will head over to the service layer where the business logic will reside. Then from the service layer, we can talk to the repository layer to get the data from the database. And then the response is sent back to the user. And all of this will be hosted on our server. So we are going to build this entire application okay, with the help of Spring Boot. And we are going to define everything we need to run this in browser. Now let us understand how you can create a Spring Boot project. Okay, So to create a Spring Boot project, you need to access a tool called Spring Initializer. So in your web browser, you can say Spring Initializer and you will see this website start.spring.io. You need to head over to this website. So we are going to make use of this website to generate the project for us. So, so what this website helps us with is it helps us with creating a Spring Boot project. So it will give us the entire structure for Spring Boot. So we'll be making use of IntelliJ, but you will now ask why can't we create the project directly in IntelliJ? So the reason is this feature is not available in the free version of IntelliJ, okay? So if you have IntelliJ Ultimate, you can make use of this feature wherein you can create a Spring Boot project. But we will stick to how we can make use of free version of IntelliJ, okay? So I'm going to make use of this website. So I'm going to say Maven over here. So here I can select Maven because Maven is the build tool that I'm going to use for my project. I'll keep Java selected. I'll make use of latest version of Spring Boot. Here, the latest version of Spring Boot is three, okay? And 3.1.1 is the latest release. But now here you will notice there are some Spring Boot versions with snapshot appended in the end. Now, snapshot is the version of Spring Boot that that has opened or been released in preview. So it might have some bugs, 
and it is recommended that you do not use snapshot version for learning. So you should use the version without snapshot written. Okay. And it has to be latest one. And also there is a possibility that you might see some other version number over here. So spring boot keeps on releasing versions every now and then, but don't worry the functioning of this project won't change. And if it changes, I'll make sure I update the video. So here now, once you're done selecting the version, you need to specify some details about the project. Like you need to specify group artifact and name. So group is nothing but the package of the project. So the package I'll say com dot embark X. So this is a domain name that I have or the website embarkx.com. So I'll keep this as the package artifact can be the name of the project. Okay. So the name is challenge app. So I'll keep this as the name and it gets auto populated over here. Now the description is you can specify any description you want. So I can say app for monthly challenges like so. And you can see the complete package name come up over here. It's auto generated. You don't need to edit this. I'll keep the packaging as jar and the Java version as 17. You can choose the right version for you, but I'll stick to Java version 17. Okay. Now this is about some configuration. Now over here we have dependencies. So what is, what does this dependency mean? So dependencies have, so this is a list of dependencies that you can add to your spring boot project and it has startup projects as well. So you can see the spring boot web. So I'll select this. So it enables you to build web applications, including restful applications with spring MVC. And it has Apache Tomcat as embedded container. Okay. So I'll add this dependency and you can see there are lots of dependencies. Like I have a dependencies for database. So you can see spring data GPA. Okay. Then you have JDBC, you have MongoDB, you have, you should have one for Postgres as well. Okay. But there are, so you can see Postgres SQL driver. Now, whatever you select over here, and if you click on explore, so you can explore what is being generated over here, you can see this project structure that is being generated. Okay. You can see like over here, like this entire pom.xml. So pom.xml is where all the dependencies would be added. So you can take a look at this and you can say close. Now, once you're done with the configuration and exploring over here, you can say generate. Now what generate will do is it will download the zip version of this particular configuration in the form of the project. Okay. And it will give you the zip version. So you can use this zip version then to work with. So I would request you all to hit generate and get the project onto your system. So I have downloaded the zip version from spring initializer website. Okay. As you can see challenge app dot zip. So this is what it gave me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract this over here. Okay. You can use any extracting software and it will give you all the files over here. Now what we are going to do is we are going to open this project with the help of IntelliJ. So let us head over to IntelliJ. So you can open IntelliJ and this is what the welcome screen that you're going to see. I'll click on open. I'll head over to the location where I downloaded and unzipped the file. So I have unzipped it over here, challenge app, as you can see, you'll see this icon and I'll say, okay. Now it will ask you whether you trust this project. Now I trust this project. I know I've downloaded this from a reputed source. Okay. Now th it's asking this because it will run some code from this folder and it just, it's just confirming and IntelliJ is just confirming from the security standpoint. So I'll say trust all the projects in this folder and trust this one. Okay. And it will open up this project for me. Okay. You'll see some tip of the day, which you can close. So you can see some processing was happening over here at the bottom. Okay. 
and here we have the entire project okay so what we have done is we have done setting up the entire project into IntelliJ. Hey there, so welcome back. So in this video, we are going to continue building our challenge application using Java Spring Boot and IntelliJ IDEA. If you have not subscribed to my channel, I would request you all to do so and also smash the like button. This will motivate me to bring more such content to you all for free. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so welcome back. So this is what we are going to build is what we have discussed in our previous video. So we are going to cover the get query or the get API for the challenges endpoint, okay? And we are going to cover the rest of the endpoints one by one, okay? So let's head over to our IntelliJ idea. So here in IntelliJ, I have the IDE set up entirely, okay? I have unzipped the project and I have opened the project. Let us take a look at what exists in our project right now and how is a typical Spring Boot project is structured, okay? So you can see here, I have the main directory where my project resides. I have some folder like IntelliJ. These are the configuration files related to IntelliJ. So we don't need to touch them. We have some files related to Maven, which again, we are not supposed to touch. Then we have the SRC folder. Now this is where all our source code will reside. So you have the main folder wherein you will be writing all the source code. And then you have the test folder wherein you will be writing all the tests that you'll need for your application. So I'll just collapse this test folder. Now within this main folder, you have Java and resources. So under Java is where all your Java files will reside. So if you expand this a bit, you will see the package structure that we have defined. And then you have this main application page, okay? So this is a page wherein you will have the main method. And this is the main method that will be responsible for running your Spring Boot application. And you can see this annotation over here, at the rate Spring Boot application, which tells that this is like, this entire file is a Spring Boot application, okay? And now you will be able to add more files and structure to your project. So under this package is where we will start writing a code, okay? And then you have the resources folder where you can have the static files and the templates. And then you have application.properties. So this is a file which is empty. It's a .properties file wherein you can store the properties that define your application. Now, if you go down, you have a pom.xml. Okay. So if you click on this and let me collapse this project structure. So you will see this is the pom.xml Maven file. Okay. This is typically needed by Maven to manage all the dependencies. And this particular file has all the information that is needed for your project. Okay. And if you scroll down, you have the group ID here. Okay. So this is the group ID of the parent and this is the group ID of the project, okay? And you can see the name of the application and the description as to what we had mentioned on the Spring Initializer website. And here we have the Java version that our application will be using. So if you scroll down, you have the dependencies. So this is the Spring Boot Starter Test, okay? And this is the Spring Boot Startup Web. So this tells that our application is a web-based application. And here is where Spring Boot will provide everything and make available everything that typically a Spring Boot web application needs. Okay, so I have this pom.xml defined. Now let us open up our project structure here and let us start writing some code to get the list of all the challenges. Okay, so like I said, 
we are building this particular endpoint get slash challenges which will return all the challenges that we have within our application so here i'm going to first define a controller okay so i'll say java class and i'll say challenge controller so i have this controller created all right and now we need something to store the list of our challenges because that is where what this controller is going to return okay so i'm going to say private list and i'm going to say challenge okay and i'm going to say challenge challenges so let's call it challenges is equal to new array list so for now i'm going to store all my challenges in the form of array list and we are going getting an error so now we are getting an error which says cannot resolve the symbol challenge okay so what we need to do is we need to click on more actions here and we need to say create a class challenge it will confirm where this class should be created so i'll say okay and you will have this class created in the same directory over here okay now this is a class where we are going to define the structure of a typical challenge that we will have in our application so what do we want to store with our challenges so i'll say private long id so we'll store three things one is id then we'll store the month and this will help us define the month against with against which the challenge is stored and then we we are going to have some description about the challenge okay so i'm going to say id and then i'm going to say string month and then let's have private string description so this should be s capital okay so this is defined now we can define the constructor okay so i can right click and say generate and i'll generate a constructor and then i will have right click generate and i'll generate getter and setters for all okay so a class is done so this is the class that will help us store all the challenges information okay and here in the controller we have that error message go away all right now let us define an endpoint to get the list of challenge so i'm going to say over here public list so this will be a method which will enable us to return all the challenges to the user and i'm going to say challenge here so since we are returning the list of all the challenges this is what our return type should be okay and i'm going to say get all challenges okay and this is the method and i'll say return i'll simply return this challenges object over here which is being stored as a list all right now i want to tell you like this this is how our application will function so from the browser or from the postman if you send a request that is going to be managed by controller the request will be routed then to service so controller will do the acceptance of request okay from the appropriate controller methods so within controller you typically have a lot of methods that are responsible for managing different kinds of requests how that is something you will see shortly and then when the request is mapped to a particular method that request is being forwarded to that of service okay now service is a place where all the logic resides like all the business logic resides and then if there is a need to interact with the database it is passed on to the repository and repository is responsible to communicate with the database and fetch the results and send the response back to service and service in turn sends the response back to controller and finally user sees the response so we don't have these two parts created yet like the service and the repository we are just working right now in the controller let us understand the controller first as to how it works and then we will make way for each one of them first service and then repository wherein we'll work with the database so for now let's focus on controller so here we have this controller created wherein we have this variable array list which is of 
type array list and then we have a method that returns all the challenges now we need this to map to a endpoint over here which is slash challenges so if the user says domain name slash challenges our application should return the list of challenges so how do we create this mapping so first you will have to mention over here an annotation which is rest controller so this annotation tells spring boot that this particular class is a controller all right and then we'll have to define another annotation so if you say add the rate you can see two suggestions come up post mapping and get mapping so if you want to create a get mapping you can use get mapping annotation if you want to create a post mapping you can create post mapping annotation so i'll say get mapping and i'll mention over here challenges like so so what we are doing is we are telling Spring Boot that, hey, this is a controller. And whenever a request comes with this particular endpoint and it's a get request, so execute this method. All right, that is what we are telling Spring Boot. Now let us run this project. So I'm going to go to challenge application. And here you're going to see this red, or oh, sorry, not red, green button. So I'll click on that and I'll say run. Now this will start running the application. You'll see a progress at the top right here. Okay. And depending on your system, this will take some time. It should not take too long. Let me expand the logs. You should see logs coming up over here. Okay. And you should see this message in the end started the application name, which indicates that our application has been started. All right. And you can see some information like Tomcat started. So Tomcat is a server which is in inbuilt and our application is running on Tomcat server on port 8080. All right. So let's head over to this port. So here in the browser, I'm going to say, I'm going to open a new tab. I'm going to say localhost. I'm going to say 8080. And I'm going to say enter. So the moment you say this, you get an error. And this is the default error page that is available within Spring Boot. Okay, this is something that we have not created, but we are seeing this error message because we are trying to access a URL for which we have not defined any functionality. Okay, so if you take a look at our source code, okay, so if I disable minimize this and if I go to our source code, we have defined the endpoint for slash challenges and not for the root URL. So I need to go to slash challenges now here you can see you have an empty array okay so this empty array says that we don't have any data for the challenges all right which is fair enough we have created an empty list and that is what we are returning okay you are seeing two buttons here raw and past okay so these buttons are coming in from a plugin that i have used which is json formatter okay so this is the plugin if you search for json formatter it's a chrome plugin which is used to format json in your browser okay so typically if there is a json response in your browser it is going to look all jumbled up okay so this plugin does the job of formatting it okay and you can see it brings this two buttons raw so whether you want to view the data in the raw format or the past format so I have this plugin installed. If you want to, you can use this. Otherwise it's completely fine. Okay. But I just wanted to let you know that this is coming because of that plugin I'm using. Okay. So don't get confused as to what is this? So yeah, so this is an empty response. All right. So we are done adding an empty response. Now, now let us understand how did our application work and how was this request served? So this request is getting served by our application. Okay. And if you add any object or anything in the array list, you are going to see the data over here. Okay. So let me show that as well to you. So I'm here in the controller class and let me add a single challenge. Okay. To our list so that we can see some output over here. So I'm going to create a constructor. I'm going to say public challenge controller. 
and here I'm going to say challenge. So a challenge object, object challenge one is equal to new challenge. And here I'm going to define the challenge. Okay. So I'm going to say one L, which is the ID January. Okay. And then I'm going to have the challenge description. So I'm going to say learn a new programming language. And I'm going to add this particular challenge one to challenges. Now, if I rerun the application, let us rerun since we have made a change. So for every change, you have to redeploy your application and the application needs to rerun on the server. So I'll switch over to my browser and I'll hit refresh. So here now you can see the data that we have initialized our challenge list with is coming in as a JSON. So this API is now working for us. And now let us talk about how our API worked. Okay. So let us analyze some, the logs for this. Okay. So let me expand this a bit and let me go to the top. So at the top, if you see, you have the spring banner. Okay. This prints in spring and it prints spring boot and the version of spring boot that you are using. Okay. Then you see this message, which says, that the application is being started. Okay. Now, if you scroll down a bit here, you will see where all the environmental variables are being set. Okay. So here it's making use of profiles. Okay. And with the help of profiles, all the application variables are being set and there are currently no active profiles because it's a brand new project that we have created and we have not defined any profiles. But profiles is a concept using which you can set environmental variables or some properties when you're running your application. For example, you can have different profiles or properties for dev environment, prod environment, QA environment, and so on. All right. So there's no active profile. So it picks up the default, which is fine for us at this stage. Then Spring Boot has an embedded server. Okay. So it comes with an embedded Tomcat server and the next set of logs talk about how Tomcat initialization happens and Tomcat is initialized for port 8080. Okay. And it starts the service. So the service is started and then the servlet engine is started. Okay. Now after the servlet engine is started, the mapping of the URL and everything happens. Okay. And if you scroll down here, the application is fully started. As you can see now, finally, in the end, okay, we have the dispatcher servlet being initialized. Okay. And this dispatcher servlet is responsible for dispatching the requests to the appropriate controller. And then the initialization is completely done. So our application is ready. Okay. As you can see onto a particular port, which is port 8080. All right. So this is how our application runs. Now what happens is when you hit this query, okay, when you hit this URL in the browser, so here is where our application is run. So we say localhost because we are running it on a local machine. And we say colon 8080 because this is the port on which our application is running right now. So if you have deployed your Spring Boot application, this will typically be replaced by your domain name. Okay. So you can have like abc.com slash challenges. All right. Or you can have api.abc.com slash challenges if you are exposing your API. So this will be replaced by the domain name and then you have slash challenges. Now, when you access the URL that is mapped to your application, so excluding challenges, this is what is mapped to your challenge to your application. Okay. Now, when you send a request here, what happens is, the request is routed to the controller. So from like all the controllers that exist in the application. So let me tell you in an application, there can be multiple controller files. That's perfectly normal. Okay. So if you're defining lots of entities and then you have lots of uh, modules inside a single application, you can have different controllers for each one of them. That is completely normal. As of now, we have only one controller. And our application knows that whenever a request comes to this particular endpoint, it is supposed to go to this particular method 
and perform the action within this particular method. Now, what does this method do? It simply returns the list object. And on the fly, during runtime, this is what is converted into JSON and returned to us as a response. So this is how typically our request flows right from the browser to the application and then again it comes back to the browser. When we hit the URL, what we are doing is we are sending a request. Okay, we are sending a request to the server. After that request is being processed, we get a response object. So this is the part of the response object. Okay, now response object has two parts. One is the response itself and then you have the status code. So we'll talk about status code a bit, okay? But we are only seeing the response right now because we are trying to access it from the browser, okay? So this is how our application processes the request. Now let us head over to the next part wherein we will write some code which will allow users to add some challenges into our application, okay? So let us switch over to our ID. So here we have get mapping, okay? To accept the challenges into our application, we will need another type of request, which is nothing but post mapping. So here you have this post annotation slash challenges, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say over here, public void add challenge, okay? And I'm going to add, write some code to add the challenges over here. Now, first thing, I need to map this to a URL. So how will I do that? You must have guessed it right. You will use post mapping annotation, okay? And you can say slash challenges. So here the URL is same, but the request type is different. So get mapping. So if a request comes with the type get, you will return all the challenges. If a request comes with the post request on the same endpoint, you will add the challenge. So same endpoint, but it's providing two behaviors based on the request type, okay? Now, what are we going to do over here? So we are going to add the challenges and we are going to say over here, challenges dot add and I'll add challenge over here. Okay, so, so we need to add this challenge object and I can return challenge added successfully. I can return this string over here. Okay, but it will return, like it will give you an error because we are, we have mentioned void over here. So I can hover on this and make this return a string. Okay, so this will return string. Now, now where do we get this challenge object from? So this is the challenge that user wants to add into our application. So how do we get this object from the user? So we need to add this as a parameter over here. Okay, so I'll say challenge, challenge, okay? Now the question is, how does this method gets this parameter, okay? So this method gets this parameter in the from the request body. Now what do I mean by request body? So whenever you send a post request, a post request typically has some additional information with it. And that is known as the request body. And request body will have some additional re request parameters that are typically needed to complete that request. Okay. And I'm going to accept the challenge object as the request body here with post mapping. So I'm going to, I'll have to tell Spring Boot that, hey, you need to get this object from the request body. How do I tell this? With a simple annotation. So I can say at the rate request body. Now this will tell Spring Boot that, hey, whenever you get a post request on slash challenges, you can call this method, but you have to also get the request body and put this or wrap that request body into this object. And that object is passed on to this particular method here, which then adds it to the challenge list, okay? And that is how the challenge is added, all right? So let us rerun our application now. So I'll stop and I'll rerun. So our application is up and running. Now, the question is, 
how do I send a post request from the browser? Okay, so you cannot send a post request from a browser. You need a tool, like a tool from where you can query any API or where you can create a request. And using that particular tool, you should be able to send all the kinds of requests like get request, post request, put request, and even a delete request. Okay. So what tool shall we use? So there are multiple tools in the market, but the one that I'm going to prefer is Postman. Okay. So Postman is nothing but it's an API platform for building and using APIs. Okay. And if you are already in developer, you must be well aware of Postman. All right. So this is the official website of Postman, which is postman.com. And you can see like there are tons of developers who are using Postman already. And this is the most popular tool out there to work with API requests. Okay. There are many other tools also, but this one is most popular. And you can go through all the features here. Okay. If you wish to, or what you can do is you can download Postman. Okay. So here you can see download the desktop app for Windows, Mac and Linux. So whichever platform you are on, you can click the icon for that and you can download the .exe or executable file for your own OS. Okay. So download this and then the installation process is fairly straightforward. So you have to just follow the installation steps like any other application on your operating system and boom, you're done. So I have already installed this particular application. So this is Postman already installed on my system. Okay. So if you open the interface, you might be asked some onboarding questions. And if you skip all of them, you will see this particular screen. Okay. Where you can see multiple options at the top. Okay. So there is an option home. You have option to access workspaces for which you need to create an account. You have an option to explore. If you click on explore, you should be able to browse all the open APIs. Okay. So I'll go back to the offline API client. So this particular interface here is called as offline API client interface by Postman. This interface has two parts. Okay. So one is the left part on which you will see all the requests that you have executed. So this is a place wherein you will see history of all the requests that you have executed. And on the right hand side, you will have a way to create and execute your request. And here at the bottom, you can see response. So here you will see response from all the requests that you have sent. Okay. You can even save your request and do a lot of stuff with Postman. Okay. You can save your request so that you don't have to create that request again. So if you're using a request, a lot of times you can make use of that feature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a post request. So you can see over here, we have this drop down to get the post request. We'll copy the URL. I'll paste the URL here. Okay. Now with the post request, we need to specify the body. So here you can see the body tag. I'll click on this and you have multiple options here, none form data. So I'll say raw and I'll select the format as JSON. Okay. So here we'll add some JSON data wherein we'll pass in the information to create a new challenge. Okay. If you want, you can copy this JSON here. So I'll copy this and I'll paste it here. Okay. So we'll use the same JSON. In fact, so I'll create the challenge. Okay. So I'll say February and I'll say learn a new or create a new app, something like this. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a post request to this endpoint and within request body, I'm saying some, I'm sending some JSON data, which is the structure of my challenge object. So all the parameters that are typically a challenge needs is what I'm sending along with this request. Now let me trigger this. The moment you trigger this, you will see a message challenge added successfully 200. Okay. So you can see you're getting a response message and a status code over here. Now, what does a status code means? So status codes talks about the status of the request. So when you send a request, 
what happened to that request? Was it successfully executed? Did it fail? Was it redirected to some other server? Or if it failed, whose issue it was? Was it was it you who was sending the bad request or was it an issue on the server's end? So all of this is communicated with the help of status codes. And there are different status codes that are available. And these status codes are standard defined for HTTP protocol. So if you're getting 200, it means OK. So 200 OK means your request was successful. So if you get 201 created, it means you had asked the server to create something for you and it's created. Okay. So typically in a post request, wherein you are adding a new challenge, you should get 201 created. If you want to like as per the rule, it should be 201 created. But right now we have not defined that and we'll go to that. But yes, we are getting 200, which means that our request is successful. Okay. Now you can even have like 400, which is nothing but bad request. Then you have internal server error. Okay. It has a status code as well. So this way, different status codes have different meanings and it helps you understand if you are communicating over the HTTP protocol as to what happened to your request. Okay. So here we got okay, which means everything is okay. And here you can see, this is a request that we just executed. It will come in in the form of history. Okay. And what I can do is I can now convert this into get request and I can send this. Now, if you send this as get request, you will see you are now getting two challenges. So this is the initial challenge that we have initialized in the app. Then you have the February challenge as well, where we say create a new app. And this is something that we created. We just created using Postman. Okay. So the code to add a challenge into our application is working perfectly fine. All right. Which means we have successfully executed our post request over here. Hey there. So welcome back. So in this video, we are going to continue building our challenge application using Java Spring Boot and IntelliJ IDEA. If you have not subscribed to my channel, I would request you all to do so and also smash the like button. This will motivate me to bring more such content to you all for free. So without further ado, let's get started. So now we are done with the post request. What is happening is we are receiving the data from the controller and we are processing it in the controller itself. But ideally, we need to create a service layer which will handle all the logic that the application needs to do. So let us head over to IntelliJ and define a service layer. So here in IntelliJ, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to say a new class and this will be challenge service. Now this is a file where all the service related code will be written. Okay. But what should this class have? So this class will for now have the list of challenge and it will manage all the addition and deletion and whatever operations we are doing on that list. Okay. So we are going to move that logic from the controller to that of the service. Okay. So I'm going to cut this from here and I'm going to have the list defined over here. And then I'm going to even move this initialization part. Okay. So I'll say over here, public challenge service. Okay. And this is the service constructor. Okay. And I have added the initialization code over here. Now I'll return the challenges. Okay. I'll copy this and I'll create a method here. Okay. So what we'll say is we'll say public void get all challenges like so. Okay. And I'll return the challenges. So we need to modify the return type here. So I'll say, I'll change the return type here. Okay. So return type is changed and I'll copy this part as well. Or let me copy this method itself. Okay. That will be better. And I can add that method over here. So I can say add challenge instead of request body. I can just have the parameter here. And this will return 
a boolean okay so i'll return true so i can say if challenge is not equal to null so we'll add a small validation here okay you add the challenge and return true else you return false like so okay now the problem is this returns a string this method so i need to hover on this and change this to boolean so we are all set okay we have the service class which has all the logic to add and retrieve the list of challenges but we have all errors in controller now so let's fix this so here in the controller for get all challenges method instead of returning the list the object of challenge what we'll say is we'll say from the service class so we'll say challenge service dot get all challenges okay so this is the object of the service class okay now we'll create a local variable okay so this is of challenge service type but we won't create it over here okay we will create it over here okay and i'll keep this as private okay so this is the object of challenge service and then i'm going to go over here and i'm going to say challenge service dot add challenge and i'll pass the challenge object here okay and since this is returning a boolean i'll accept a boolean value here okay so i'll say is challenge added like so okay so if the challenge is added so if challenge added then i'll return this okay else i'll return challenge not added successfully like so so i'll say challenge not added successfully something like this okay so this is a small validation that we are doing at our end okay now the question is we have not initialized the challenge service object how do we initialize this so one way is you can like so you can say challenge service is equal to new challenge service something like this okay but we don't need to do this way so spring manages the dependency for us okay so we need to just specify the parameter here so we can specify the object of challenge service and i need to say this dot challenge service is equal to challenge service now who provides this dependency to the challenge controller class so this is provided by spring boot and spring boot with the inversion of control mechanism makes sure that if this class requires this dependency which we are specifying in the constructor during runtime what it will do is it will it will make the object available of this type and it will pass this to this particular con constructor so that this is initialized okay so this will be taken care by spring boot but for this to happen we need to tell spring boot that hey you need to manage this particular class how do we tell that so this is just a normal class how do we tell spring boot that you need to manage this particular class by telling spring boot that this is a service and how do we tell spring boot that this is a service we can do that with the help of a simple annotation which is service annotation so this annotation tells spring boot that hey this is a service class and you need to manage this class so during runtime it will make the object available for this class and it will serve it to challenge controller so this is handled and our code is also error free okay so i'll just optimize imports here we don't need this import and i'll redeploy our application so our application is running now if i switch over to postman okay i can get the list of all the challenges you'll see we have one challenge right now okay which is what we initialized in the service constructor okay now what i can do is i can pass one more challenge here so let me head over to post request over here okay and here in the body if i collapse this i have a way to create one more challenge so i'll say send and you will see challenge added successfully okay now if i go to post and if i say 
sorry, not post. If I go to get and if I get the challenges, you will see the challenge is being successfully added. Okay. Now, one problem here is we need to pass during the post request, we need to pass the ID also. So if I try to add a challenge without ID, what happens? Challenge added successfully. But now if I get all the challenges, you can see here, this challenge has ID as that of null. Now ID is nothing but a unique identifier, which typically users should not be allowed to set. Okay. So the application itself should generate the unique identifier and set it during the saving the object when it's saving the object. So now, so what I need to do is I need to manage this ID variable by ourself. So we'll switch over to IntelliJ and here in the service class, what I'm going to do is I am going to, I'm going to create a field private long ID and I'll initialize this ID to that of one L. Okay. And instead of ID, I'll call this as next ID. So this is the next ID that we should assign to the object. Okay. Now what we will do is before adding the challenge. Okay. I'll say challenges dot set ID. Okay. So I can set ID not over here, not to the list. So I'll have to add it to challenge dot set ID like so. And I need to say next ID plus plus. So what we are doing is we are initializing it to one and we'll set it to one and then we'll also increment after the setting is done. So the next object will get the ID as that of two. Okay. That is it. So let us run this. So if you run this and if you don't provide the ID or even if you provide the ID, that ID would be overridden by the auto generated ID. And if you don't provide the ID, it won't matter. So here in Postman now, okay, I'm going to get the challenges. So you have only one challenge right now. So let us trigger a post request. Okay. So I'm going to send the post request without an ID. I'll send and I'll try getting the challenges and you'll see. Okay. So you have the ID starting as one because so these two have same ID because we are already initializing the object with ID one. So what I will do is I will remove that initialization. Like either I can start the ID with two or I can just get rid of this initialization. So I'll get rid of this initialization like so. Okay. And let us rerun. So this should be good now. Okay. So now our application is running. Now if I send the get request, you don't have any challenges. Okay. So I'll close all the tabs and I'll try to do a post request. Post request does not have any ID. Let me send this. So challenge added successfully. Now let me do a get request. So you can see we have an auto generated ID of one. Now if I add one more challenge and if I try to get it, you will see the IDs are now being auto generated. Okay. And if I try to add a challenge with any random ID, like I say ID colon 5,000, let's say. Okay. And if I send the request, you'll see it got added, but let us check the ID. So the ID is three and it's, it's not 5,000. Okay. So the ID, is completely now in our control and we are not allowing users to define the ID right now. All right. So ID is now being handled by our application. And typically this is the best way to go about like ID should be under your control as a developer. And the reason is like it's a unique identifier. You cannot allow your users to define IDs in your system or unique identifiers in your system. So I'll tell you an example. If you go to open a bank account, you get a customer ID. Okay. That customer ID is generated by bank. You cannot set your preference. Like I want this kind of customer ID or that kind of whatever is generated by bank. That is what is given to you and you have to use that. So that is what the identifier for you. If someone from your family will open the bank account, he will get another unique ID, which will be his custom ID. 
okay so this is one example of how ids are managed in real world with the help of banks now we are done managing ids and we have a get request and a post request now what we need to define is we need to define a get request to get a single challenge okay for a particular month we need to define a put request to update a challenge and we need to define a delete request to delete a challenge okay so let us start with the get request for getting a particular challenge so i'm here in intellij and i'm going to go to the controller okay and within the controller i'm going to create one more mapping okay so i'll just copy this code here i'll create one more mapping and i'll call this method as get a challenge and this particular method will need an input as to which challenge do you want so i'll say long id okay and instead of get all challenge i'll say get challenge okay so i can just remove get a challenge and i can say get challenge and here also get challenge so this method is something that we need to define in our service and i'll pass in the id here okay now this is what we have defined okay now i need to hover on this and i need to resolve the error by creating a method in the challenge service okay so here i'll say okay so here this method is returning a list of challenge which is not right so i'll return a challenge object since we are just returning a single challenge and i'll say return challenges dot get so this get won't work because for getting a challenge okay using this get method you have to pass in the index and index is not what we really have we have a property of challenge which is nothing but an id okay so what i need to do is i need to say over here for okay i need to define a for each loop and i need to say challenge and i need to go through challenges okay and i need to compare so i need to say if challenge dot get id okay we need to define the object here as well so i'll say challenge now challenge dot get id dot equals okay id so if the id matches then we are returning the challenge okay otherwise we return null okay so this is a method that we have written okay let me format this a bit okay here right so so you have this method get challenge okay which accepts the parameter as id we have a for loop that it reads through the challenge list okay and you get a particular challenge object and for every challenge object you are getting the id and comparing it with the id that you have received if there is a match you return that particular challenge and if this for loop is exhausted and you don't find any match you return a null okay which means you did not find the challenge and the challenge does not exist so now here in controller okay we are not going to return the list of challenge and i'm going to modify the return type here okay so i'm going to go to more more actions and i'm going to change the return type here like so okay so from all the suggestions i ch choose changing the return type because that is what actually we are doing okay but the thing is i don't actually directly want to return the response of this particular method here okay so i need to accept the object here and then i can say if challenge is not equal to null okay then i need to return challenge okay else i need to return so so here i need to return something if i don't find the challenge and let us hold a bit on this one okay so i'll just comment this part of code we'll come back to this okay as to how we will handle the situation of challenge not found okay but typically what you can do is you can simply return null for now okay so i'll say null okay and the error will go away okay no issue as such you can also specify an else over here so i can say else 
So yeah, this mapping is done. Now the question is, how do we get this ID? Okay. So we have to get this ID, right? So we can get this ID right from the URL with the help of parameter within the URL. Okay. So when making the get request to this URL, you can say slash one. And this one is nothing but the ID of which you, which you want the challenge for. So you can say one or you can say two or you can say three and so on. Okay. So actually what we want is the month over here. Okay. Not the ID. Okay. So this will be the month and not the ID. So I'll just refactor the small mistake over here. Okay. So I'll say month over here and I'll say month over here. Okay. And if I go inside the method, this has to be month. And instead of get ID, this will be get month and month over here. Okay. So small refactoring over here. Also month is a string over here. Okay. So what we can do is we can have string over here like so. Okay. And in the controller also we'll have string. So this sorts it out. Okay. Now, if you go over here, instead of ID, you will pass in February like so. So challenges slash February. Okay. Or now the question is, this is going as the parameter within the URL. Okay. Or a dynamic variable within URL. So for getting the challenge within the month of February, you will pass in Feb for getting the challenge for January, you will pass in Jan and so on. Okay. So how do you get this parameter or variable from within the URL? And the answer is you can make use of path variables. So you can say path variable and you will get the path variable that is being passed. Now, how do we tell Spring Boot, okay, where this path variable will be entered? So for that, we need to add in the URL like this. We need to say month. So this tells Spring Boot that, hey, this particular part of the URL will be dynamic and it will be entered by the user on the fly. And whatever is entered is should be mapped to this particular parameter or this particular variable and it's mapped and you have the path variable annotation as well to mention that. Okay. And whatever is mapped is passed in to the service class. Okay. So I'll rerun this. Let us see the output. Okay. So let us try getting all the challenges first. So you don't have any challenges. Okay. So now let me create a challenge. So I'll create a challenge for the month of February. So now we have added the challenge into our application. And what you will observe is if I try to get the challenge with a capital F, okay, I get a response. You can see over here, but if I try to get a challenge with small f, I do not get a response. Okay. And this is bad because you cannot expect the URL to be in the correct case. So your application has to perform a match for the correct case. Okay. So here, what we can do is what we will do. So here we'll go to service and I'll compare by ignoring the case. Okay. And I'll rerun the application. So we'll wait till the application builds. So the application is up. Now I'll create a challenge and now I'll try to get the challenge by capital F. So it works and small f it works. Okay. So this is perfectly fine. All right. Now what happens if, if I say March over here? Okay. So if, if you say March, you don't get any response, but you are not even getting an error because March, challenge does not exist or there is nothing in our application for March yet. But ideally you should not get 200 okay over here. You should get the response as 404 not found or something like that. So how do we handle this now? So if the object does not exist in our system, we need to return the appropriate status code and we can do this with the help of a mechanism. So let us head over to our ID. And let us switch to controller. So here now in the controller, we need to customize the response and we need to have better control on the status codes. 
So for this, we need to make use of response entity class. Now, what is response entity class? Response entity class in Spring is a wrapper using which you can represent the entire HTTP response, including the status code and body. Now, it provides us, the developers, a way to customize the HTTP response that is returned from the controller method. Okay, so let us see how you can make use of it. So here, since you are returning the challenge object, you can say response entity like so, and you can specify the return type as response entity. Okay, so I'll just move the parameter part to the next line over here. Okay, now here, when we are returning this, we need to say new response entity and you will have the challenge object and you will say http http status dot okay okay now what this will do is it will send challenge object as a part of the response with the help of response entity and also it will mention the status code now instead of returning null we need to say new response entity and here we need to say not found okay so http status dot not found like so okay so this way you can handle the response codes now the benefit of using response entity is you get to do customization of http response and also you need to do you get a chance to do flexible response handling okay and also response entity class helps with consistent api design so sure this particular method is returning the response wrapped in response entity here also you can follow the similar philosophy and you can have all methods that return the response entity object so with this you can have consistent response and consistent api, des API design for your api okay now if you take a look at the http status okay if you hover on this okay so if you are on windows you can press control and hover and if you're on mac you can press command and hover so this will get converted into a link click on this and you'll see all the status codes inside this class so this is 200 okay this is created 202 accepted and so on so you can scroll through okay and you can see bad requests unauthorized if you scroll down you will have 500 internal server error bad gateway and so on so you have all the status codes that are defined in http status class now after you have made use of this let us run the application and let us see the output okay so after running the application if you head over to postman and if you try sending something that does not exist you get a custom response code which is 404 and if i create a challenge okay you'll see challenge added successfully and now if i say february you get 200 okay so you can see depending on the output of the request you are able to get the appropriate status codes okay so you can implement this for all your apis okay in fact you can go over here and you can say response entity like so it can be string and here new response entity all right and you can copy this and you can add it over here also and here you can say challenge not added successfully and not only the message you can also change the status code over here okay so you can say not found okay so this is managed now and similar way you can do it for the list here like so and here you can say new response entity comma http status dot okay okay so this is enabling us to provide a consistent api design for our apis and we are also having a better control now on status code otherwise we were just passing the message here 
like challenge not added successfully but the status code would have been 200 okay okay because like we have not customized the status code yet all right so this is managed now okay hey there so we have come really far with our challenge application we have built out quite a few endpoints and we have few endpoints still remaining so in this video we are going to cover the remaining endpoints and we are going to see them execute in postman so are you ready for this let's get started also i would like to mention that if you have not subscribed to this channel i would request you to do so so that you can stay updated with the next videos in this particular series this series has quite a few video that will be coming up so i would also request you to press the bell icon and to put on the notifications so that you can be notified whenever i launch a new video and if you are not aware of the previous videos that we have uploaded so i would request you to check the video description or to check out my channel for the remaining videos that i have published around this particular project so this particular series involves building the entire challenge application using java spring boot framework from scratch so without further ado let's begin the action hey there welcome back so far what we have done is we have worked on the two get request and we have also worked on the post request so post is used to create the challenge and get is used to get the challenge so we can get all the challenges or get a challenge by a specific month now let's work upon the put and the delete request so put will be responsible for updating the challenge and delete will be responsible for deleting a particular challenge so let us head over to our id now here I'm going to switch over to my controller and we are going to have the controller definition. So here I'll just press enter and I'll start defining a new method. So I'll say public and we'll pass in the response entity here and I'll say string and I'll say update challenge here. Okay. Now here we need an ID. So this ID will define which challenge we are updating and we will also need the challenge object okay so i'm going to say challenge and i'll say updated challenge like so now what we need to do is we need to call the challenge service class and we need to say update challenge so i'll say update challenge so we have not created this method or defined it yet we will do shortly okay but for now, I'm just using this method and based on how we are using, we'll be creating the method inside the service class. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say update challenge. We'll pass in the ID as well as the updated challenge object. Now from this particular method, I need Boolean. So Boolean response, which tells me whether this challenge is successfully updated or not. So I'll say is challenge updated like so and now based on this particular response that we are getting i'm going to return the response to the api okay so for now i can just say return new i'll say response entity or i can just copy this from here okay so or not this one so we can copy from this one like so because it's a string response over here and that is what we need so i'll just paste it over here i'll say is challenge updated and if it's updated it will say challenge updated successfully and if it's not challenge is not updated successfully okay so we are done writing the response over here okay now what we need to do is we need to create this method so i'll hover on this and i'll say create method update challenge now this has created the method over here okay now here in this particular method we are going to use all these parameters to update the challenge in the list okay so i'm going to update the challenge now but to update the challenge i need to get the challenge first with this particular id okay and what i'm going to do is i'm going to write a for loop 
okay so i can just take this for loop from here like so so from challenge challenges okay i'll get id over here and i'll compare this with so i'll say equals and i'll compare this with this particular id over here okay and here i'm going to say challenge dot i'll say set set month and here i'll say updated challenge dot get month okay then i'll say challenge dot so we need to do this for all the parameters so i can say challenge dot description and i need to get the description so we need to update the month and the description both for the challenge object okay so since we are iterating using the for loop we have the current challenge object in this particular object over here and i'm replacing the values here okay and this values are being replaced only if the id matches okay and we are getting the id from the controller here now once this is done i'll return true over here and if the loop exits i say return false like so all right so this is the update challenge method all right now what we can do is we can simply run this particular app and let us test the output in the postman so the application is running now in the postman what i'm going to do is i'm going to head over to the post request and here i'm simply going to copy this or we can simply modify this request as well so i'll say put i'll keep the endpoint same and here i'll remove the id okay but one thing that we have missed over here so here if you come i have not mapped this particular thing to a url so i press i missed this okay so i need to say put mapping over here okay so since we have get mapping defined here we have post mapping also we have something called as put mapping and you can see over here so you can keep the url same so i'll say slash challenges okay and here we need to tell the controller from where we are getting these two parameters okay so long we are getting from path variable and this particular thing we are getting from request body okay now path variable over here is this particular path variable so id comes as a part of the url okay now if you rerun this so let us rerun and let us switch over to our postman so our app is running now now here in postman i have the request ready okay so i have slash challenges slash i'll say one okay and i'll try and update this but if let me check whether we have any challenges okay so i'll try getting all the challenges okay we don't have challenges so we need to create a challenge first so i'll create a challenge first for the month of february and i'll say save now let us get the challenges so we have the challenge now created which is of id one now what we can do is we can update the challenge okay so i can say put challenge one here and i'm going to like send this update so i'll say february here and i can say update it in the end like so create a new app update it like so and i'll hit the send request the challenge is updated now if you try and get the response you will see that the data is updated okay now if i try and update against an id which does not exist you will get 404 not found and the message is challenge not updated successfully okay so you can modify the message if you want but this is how the update query works okay so this is about update now so we are done with the put request now let us start talking about the delete request that we wish to do now with the delete request you will be accepting the parameter or the id as a part of the url and we'll be deleting that particular challenge from our application so in order to do that we will head over to the controller and here i'll start defining the delete method so i'm going to say public 
response entity and I'll have the string as the response type and I'll say delete challenge like so and here I'll say long ID now I'm going to have a mapping created for this and I'll say delete mapping over here this is the annotation and here I'm going to just mention the same parameter or the same URL so we have one URL like the same URL being mapped to different functions which is like put delete post sorry not post post and get have same URL but put and delete have similar URLs and here I'm going to say call this as path variable so this method is getting this from the path variable we need to specify that and now I'm going to start writing the code so I'm going to say challenge service dot delete challenge and I'm going to pass in the ID and I'm going to accept a boolean return from here so I'll say is challenge deleted like so and I'm going to say I'm going to have a similar if else condition over here so I'm going to say is challenge deleted challenge deleted successfully or challenge not deleted like so okay so this is our delete function and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a method in the service now here what we can do is we can say challenges dot remove if okay and I'm going to say challenge like so and challenge dot get ID dot equals and I'm going to pass in the ID over here now this particular piece of code is a lambda expression that we are using over here so we are saying from the list challenges remove if now this is a method that is available in the list interface so since this is a list over here we are making use of this method remove if okay now within this method we are passing in this expression where challenge represents an individual element of challenges list okay and what we are doing is we are comparing this okay so this is a condition to evaluate each element in the list okay and we are checking if this particular object's ID is equal to the ID which we have received over here okay and if there is a match it's being removed because the method says remove if so if this is true we remove that element and here we need to return the response of this particular method over here okay so so overall the meaning of this code is to remove the elements from the challenge list that have an ID matching the given ID and if the element is found with the matching ID the remove if method will remove it from the list and it also returns true if there is no element with the matching ID this entire expression or this entire method call returns false okay so this does the job that we need it to do and I'm going to rerun our application so let us rerun and let us see what the output looks like so the application is running now here let us create a challenge first so I'll get the challenge created and let us check what challenge is created so it's a February challenge now we can have a delete request okay so here instead of put I'll change this to delete I don't need body here okay and I'll say delete challenge number two so two challenge we don't have so if I fire this request you will get challenge not deleted 404 not found which is of course a challenge which this ID does not exist so I'm going to say challenges one and if I trigger this you see that the challenge is now deleted and now if you try to get all the challenges you are not going to get anything so this is how you can work with the delete request now here in the controller if you come over so this is our controller we have different mappings defined like we have def delete mapping put mapping get mapping and post mapping okay now we can even make use of the request mapping annotation so here at the top I can say request mapping 
like so. So this is the annotation that is used in Spring to map a web request to a specific controller. Okay. Now what we can do is we have repeated patterns in all our URLs. So we have slash challenges that is repeating across the entire design. Okay. Over here. So what I can do is I can take this part and I can add it over here. Okay. So now what we can do is we can just do away with this. So we don't need to specify challenges in our URL. Okay. Because we are not specifying it at the class level. Okay. So we can get this removed like so. so. I'm removing it from all the URLs and now our URLs look much more cleaner. Okay. So here what we are saying is we are saying at the class level, if there is any request that is coming to this particular endpoint, so our domain name slash challenges, it should be routed to this particular controller here. Okay. And this is the root URL of this particular controller. So you have all the URLs defined within. So you have like slash month, okay, which will be slash challenges slash month. So that is taken care of by Spring MVC framework. Okay. So if you rerun the application, so let me rerun this. So we'll rerun and we'll wait for its deployment. And now here, if you come to the postman, and now if I try to trigger this URL, this URL will still work as it is. Okay. So you can post a new challenge. It will get added. You can get the challenge now. It will work fine. So with the help of request mapping, what you can do is you can make your like methods a bit clean. Okay. So instead of specifying all the repeated patterns in the URL, you can just specify them at the class level. Okay. So whenever you specify this at the class level, it just sets the base URL for all the handler methods within that particular class. So it's, it's really, really helpful out there. And uh, so, yeah, this is about request mapping is what I wanted to tell you. So we have completed all the functionalities that we discussed. Okay. So everything that we needed to store and work with challenges is now done. So what you can do now is you can feel free to update and add more endpoints or functionalities to practice and learn more about Spring Boot.